like the organizers for putting this program together and also for invitation. So it's actually, I just realized it's the first time that I'm in Santa, I'm Santa Barbara that I've seen the rain like this today. It's really quite amazing. Actually. Yeah, especially, yes, exactly. So, okay. So this uh, talk will focus on using this kind of uh, topics of long range connectivity, long range interaction for, you know, building quantum machines. And, you know, we will be building mach uh, quantum machines using neutral atoms. And this is an image of something which is called magneto-optic trap. So that's how all of these experiments which I'm going to tell you about start. So we typically start with something like 10 million um, uh, of atoms. So in principle, if we can control each of these atoms, you know, individually and kind of, you know, in a uh, 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 kind of uh, complete, you know, system, we could have, you know, basically 10 million of, of qubits. And if it's too few, there are ways to actually add to that. So basically the challenge here is that given that we have a, a large number of cold identical uh, neutral atom uh, uh, qubits is how to control them. And so basically kind of motivated by that, um, a few years ago in collaboration with my colleagues, um, uh, Markus Greiner and Vlad Nulicic, we started kind of a building a new approach to kind of uh, uh, scalable uh, quantum systems where we literally build quantum systems atom by atom. So here what we do, we start with atoms uh, um, uh, trapped in optical tweezers and we uh, then basically, you know, typically tries, try to load many of them at once and, you know, this is not always successful. The system, for example, shown here has a lot of entropy. And so the way how we get rid of the entropy, we take a picture of the atoms, figure out which traps are full and which are empty and basically rearrange them in any kind of desired uh, configuration. And so typically then the atoms are sitting few micrometers away from each other to make them interact. What we do, we excite them into Rydberg states. And you know, that is the mechanism through which we enable, you know, uh, tunable, potentially long range interactions. So, uh, and as I said, it's a collaboration with Marcus uh, and, and Vladen's group. So let me just, you know, take a few minutes to talk about the type of interactions. You know, even Wolf, you know, was already mentioned, you know, it's actually this Rydberg system feature very nice, you know, long range connectivity. Actually in this talk specifically, we are not going to use this, you know, in direct way. And specifically what we'll do, we'll use the idea of Rydberg blockade, which actually makes this interaction in a way the shortest range possible, and in, a, in such a way that it's kind of digital. So the interaction is either on or off. And the idea here is the following. So if you start with two atoms very far away and you drive them resonantly, of course, they will be completely independent. So there will be non-interacting. But if you bring them close, then this kind of strong interaction, you know, takes over very quickly. And so if we bring the atoms sufficiently close, then we'll create a condition where we can excite one atom or another, but never both. That's the essence of this Rydberg blockade. And so basically, what, you know, and what follows, we will use this interaction to kind of, if you want, digitize the interaction process. So the interactions will be either off or on, and, you know, regardless then of how close the atom is sitting to each other, at this point, the interaction is turned off. And so this is the idea of this Rydberg blockade, which actually uh, turns out to be a very efficient way to kind of do, for example, quantum logic, to do entanglement. And uh, altogether, this allows one to build this kind of highly high fidelity, uh, coherent multi-qubit system where basically, you know, you start with some atoms and tweezers, which are kind of random, then you arrange them in, uh, um, um, uh, in certain registers, you know, and then you excite these atoms, you change the internal state, and then eventually you read uh, the RAM, that's kind of the basic uh, principle of all of these um, uh, experiments. And by now, it's actually a very popular research uh, directions. There are many exciting directions pursued. Already you've heard about some of them, and actually there are a couple of hundred of new experiments of this time is being built around the world, and actually at least six com companies already are trying to commercialize this uh, uh, technology. So in our lab, um, uh, we are now operating the third generation of this. Um, uh, neutral atom array, and so in this system we can actually control up to about 1,000 um, uh, of uh, atoms. So the way how we create these traps now is using this uh, device called special light modulator. It's basically a computer-generated hologram which we project into a vacuum uh, chamber. It's an amazing device. The only drawback of that is actually relatively slow. So to move atoms around, which actually will be a key feature of my talk, we use another channel where we have these two crossed acoustic deflectors. These are basically devices which 
convert you know, a radio frequency into sound, into the deflection of the light. And using that, we can actually move the atoms around uh, you know, <clears throat> very, very quickly, or relatively quickly. So uh, the third generation uh, have a few key upgrades. So first, we have somewhat larger systems. We also have high fidelities. I will tell you more about, about that. And we also have much more advanced control to compare to what we had be, uh, before. And so with systems of this type, you know, it's kind of a little bit of special time in our lab. So it actually was a lot of fun. In the last couple of years, we explored a wide variety of different things, various uh, phase diagrams, uh, push the systems away from equilibrium. There will be talk tomorrow by Maxime about many body scars. Uh, you know, Norm already mentioned this work on topological spin liquids, and we also explored, for example, ideas to kind of try to accelerate combinatorial optimization. There is actually a nice poster by Simone, uh, if you're interested. And um, actually, there is now more than one uh, system of this type, both at Harvard and actually in broader at Cambridge area. So, in fact, there is a, a machine um, across the river uh, in our startup company, Quarry Computing, which actually, since a year, is publicly accessible. So, and I think many of, I've heard many of you already are playing with that. So, but I will not talk about any of this today. I'll focus, you know, so all of these ideas are mostly kind of using analog simulations. So here I will focus on digital um, uh, processors and in particular with the idea of addressing something which um, you know, we'll call quantum error correction frontier. So in this approach, <clears throat> what we do, we typically encode qubits in a long-lived uh, uh, states of atoms, such as, for example, uh, spin states, hyperfine states. And then we excite the atoms uh, uh, with very short pulses to the Rydberg states, and we excite them into the Rydberg states and bring them back very quickly. And so this is the approach which, you know, 20 years ago when we initially started thinking about this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, ideas, um, uh, we originally kind of envisioned as a kind of way to really, you know, build, you know, quantum computers and, you know, qu quantum uh, processors. And um, uh, there was a number of pioneering experiments in the field over the last two decades, which demonstrated all of the elements uh, of this um, approach. But up to very recently, you know, there was one challenge, you know, and in this kind of um, uh, approach, the fidelity of operations was actually relatively low. So it requires really a new generation of, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what's it, generation X or, you know, what is, you know. So these guys, you know, Harry uh, Levine and, and Hannes Pichler, actually, they came up with the, you know, very kind of clever idea how to actually implement the quantum logic operation. And this is a very simple operation where you just basically pick up conditional phase shift pi for state 1, 1, when you excite the atoms from the state 1, 1, uh, which actually, you know, once they had this idea, we implemented this uh, uh, protocol next day, literally, and it's actually, you know, drastically improved this, this, this fidelity. So, the idea here is to basically um, have a sequence of two pulses which do this kind of choreography on a block sphere for these two types of states which are excited, you know, one one state and zero one state, and they, they just bring back the population with just the right phase, with the right, if you, you know, adjust the detuning and, and, um, uh, and timing uh, uh, correctly. And so uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, Levin Pichler gate is already a few years old, and it immediately brought us, you know, fidelities, you know, cl close to maybe 98 uh, 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 percent. So this was already an interesting starting point. And then another kind of uh, important idea, which will be central um, uh, to my talk, is um, something which we call reconfigurable quantum architecture. So it was already mentioned a little bit uh, in the talk of um, Andrew. So basically, you know, once you uh, 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 encode qubits in these hyperfine states, not only they have very long lifetime, but also we can move atoms around without destroying the coherence. And it turns out to be a very, very powerful approach because it allows us to basically change the connectivity of our processor on the fly. It turns out to be very special because on one hand, it enables one to have truly non-local uh, connectivity to the, uh, for the processor. And it also enables us, you know, um, an extraordinary degree of parallel efficient classical control. Both of these will be, you know, prominently featured uh, in, 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 in my talk. So um, the recent uh, uh, results were also enabled by a couple of technical upgrades. 
So first of all, we now have moved beyond the Levin Pichler gate. So we used some very nice ideas, in particular by Guido Popillo and Hans Peter Buchler's group. And with technical upgrades to actually improve our fidelities to the level of about 99% uh, two qubit gate fidelities. We also now have fully programmable parallel single qubit uh, operations using the two crossed acoustic optic deflectors. We can basically eliminate patterns of atoms and rotate them um, uh, in a kind of de desired way. And finally, this reconfigurable architecture also allows us to uh, uh, read out qubits in the mid circuit and what uh, we do to accomplish that we just take some qubits which we want to read out to the separate zone and just image them separately, you know, without perturbing basically uh, the rest. So uh, all of these things, you know, enable kind of uh, a new generation of experiments and actually there are many different directions. So one can, for example, you know, uh, do uh, analog uh, simulation, then stop it, and then some, do some digital operations, for example, to measure things like entanglement. You can also <coughs> have new tools for many body physics, you know, think about things like braiding and, and so on. So uh, we are also thinking, you know, in collaboration with Susanna's group, and uh, actually it's shown nicely by a poster uh, by Stefan, uh, to apply these ideas to simulate quantum chemistry, also to polity topological matter, like as gauge theories, and actually, you know, um, uh, people like, you know, Peter's uh, group, you know, start really thinking about some very fancy ideas of building <coughs> for fermionic quantum computers. So all of these are actually very cool, and I think they are really label, label a new, completely new playground for these quantum simulators. But I should uh, say right away, the key challenge will be, you know, if we really want to create exotic uh, phases or do some very deep circuits, clearly we'll be, you know, uh, controlling errors while scaling up. And this is this uh, quantum error correction frontier, which I would say maybe a central challenge in the entire field of quantum information. So basically we need to, you know, figure out how to suppress error dramatically. And the only way to, known way how to do it is to use quantum error correction. This is what I would like to focus the rest of my talk um, uh, on. So basically, what I'd like to uh, do today is to introduce to you kind of, you know, what we think about a first generation of a logical processor, which actually looks like a processor because it has a storage zone where we'll store qubits. We, there is an entangling zone where we'll move these qubits to entangle them and actually also has this without zone where we will we'll, uh, uh, read uh, these qubits uh, out. So to kind of, uh, as a warm up, you know, to give you a sense about what you know, type of things we can do. I will uh, just have a very quick, you know, recap of what quantum error correction, and I'd like to thank Andrew for fantastic introduction here. So, um, so basically the quantum error correction uh, ideas built on the ideas of classical error correction, where basically use, uh, one uses redundancy, for example, to encode, you know, one zero in, in three zeros. And um, uh, basically, you know, then, you know, correct, you know, uh, by just majority voting. Of course, extending it to quantum domain seems initially daunting. And actually, I still remember this time where people said, oh, quantum error correction is impossible um, because of things like no cloning theorem. You cannot duplicate information. You also cannot measure. You keep, it looks like we need to measure the state to actually correct this error. But nevertheless, you know, um, it turns out it is possible to do uh, quantum error correction. And the idea here is you want to store the information non-locally. So you basically distribute, use entanglement to distribute one qubit, one logical qubit among uh, many uh, physical uh, qubits. And then uh, what you do, you, you measure something which is called stabilizers to basically detect local errors without destroying the quantum information encoded. And uh, through use of this non-local um, en encoding, so this logical qubit degrees of freedom uh, are very hard to accidentally, accidentally manipulate. So that's kind of the basis of this protection. So if one of these qubits is flipped, you can measure certain stabilizer and figure out that error occurred without destroying uh, the, uh, the quantum information. But of course, you will realize immediately, you know, that this delocalized quantum information is also what makes it hard to manipulate it deterministically. It's what it makes it hard to, for example, do quantum logic between these uh, delocalized um, uh, qubits. So to kind of, as a kind of warm up, you know, uh, let me um, uh, talk about, you know, something that, you know, Andrew mentioned, he mentioned surface code. So the kind of the even, you know, predecessor to the surface code was a Tori code, was actually the idea of <coughs> Alexei Kitaev, who actually showed that, you know, basically if you kind of have a grid of qubits, 
uh, uh, on this uh, non-trivial topology, you can use kind of, you know, uh, uh, topology to gain insights about how quantum error correction works. So, for example, if you encode a logical qubit in something which goes around it, uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, a, a torus, what you need to do, you need to basically, you know, effectively cut this torus, you know, you know, basically destroy a lot of qubits which go around the other direction in order to damage this information. Otherwise, you can really preserve this, 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 this qubit. But, so basically, you know, the way how it's <coughs> sorry, done, it's constructed from data qubits, which you, where you store data, you, and stabilizers, which local, uh, which measure this, you know, uh, sorry, and fillers, which measure local stabilizers. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, you know, this is kind of the basis for uh, uh, this type of approaches, but you would immediately say, well, like doing, creating this uh, toric qubit on a torus seems kind of complicated, you know, because we have two-dimensional system. Actually, it turns out not to be the case, you know, because we can move qubits around. And here is a movie which actually shows how to create a toric code on a torus, which we've done already a couple of years ago, where basically there is this one long range move which kind of closes the torus. So these are these ancilla qubits which measure these local stabilizers, right? And basically this kind of one move, you know, is what actually enables this, you know, uh, 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 kind of implementation of this non-trivial geometry. So there are two things which I want to mention. So first off, to make this movie, so in this movie what we do, we can call two qubits actually, one going one way and another one going another way. But actually in order to do it, we just use two control parameters, two control voltages. One is moving this grid of ancillas up and down and one is left and right. And so, and you know, in fact, you know, it can be programmed, uh, programmed, programmed very efficiently by just, you know, specifying this special light modulator profile and AOD uh, waveform and this kind of efficient control over uh, logical qubits rather than classical qubits is really the key kind of feature of my talk. It's the key to what I will show in the following. So, okay, so let me kind of illustrate it now specifically with the uh, idea of doing quantum logic between two encoded qubits. So suppose we have two logical qubits, you know, delocalized, you know, in the way how, how it's uh, uh, shown here. So uh, in general, if you want to do quantum operation uh, between them, uh, there are a few approaches. And one approach, if you have only local connectivity, what you need to do, you need to do something which is called lattice surgery. You need to basically merge these qubits and then somehow make sure that each, you know, the information, you know, stored here somehow starts, you know, feeling the presence of the information which is stored on the light. So actually in practice, it involves actually braiding of, of qubits around. And uh, it turns out that if you want to make this braiding fault tolerant, you need to actually make many of the stabilizer measurements. In fact, you need to make around D rounds of stabilizer measurements. But actually it turns out that that's not the only way to entangle logical qubits. And actually there's another way which has been known already since about 20 years. And this is something which is called transversal gate operations. So what one can do is one can just take one of these uh, blocks, move it on the top of each other, and then basically do local, for example, control node operations between pairs of qubits, you know, and actually it turns out that it, you know, due to transversal property, it will actually implement the gate between two logical qubits. So these uh, transversal operations, transversal logical uh, operations, turns out to be very, very powerful. First of all, because they inherently fault tolerant, so the errors don't have a chance to kind of spread very far. So actually it turns out that you don't need the rounds of uh, error correction. <coughs> Moreover, connected to this subject of the conference, this enables a long range direct connection between logical uh, qubits and can, you know, save you significantly in terms of this kind of swapping and, you know, kind of, you know, straight transfers. But actually what's more importantly in terms of our uh, approach is that, you know, in this kind of uh, situation, what we can do, we can really treat each of these kind of logical qubit as a kind of super atom. So we can really control, rather than controlling single qubit at a time, we can really think about this block like as one big atom, which we can move, you know, and operate and control, right? And so basically what it means is that we are going now from controlling over physical qubits to control over logical qubits. And it turns out to be very, very powerful. Okay, let me illustrate it on a couple of examples. So the first example is um, 
that uh, of the logical synod with the uh, surface codes. So surface codes was introduced by uh, by um, uh, by Andrew. So in this experiment, what we'll do is we'll prepare one logical uh, qubit in a plus state, another one in a zero state, and just do one entangling operation. And uh, uh, you know, the simplest kind of you know smallest example would be. Uh, there's um, uh, nine qubit encoding, basically distance-free logical qubit. So what you can do here, you can just measure, you know, uh, basically, you know, prepare, you know, uh, one of these in the state plus and measure z stabilizers, prepare um, uh, another one in zero and measure x stabilizers. So prepare their desired states like this. And then after that, all you need to do, you just need to move them on the top of each other, you know, pulse a laser, you know, uh, uh, bring them apart. So this is entire, uh, 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 logical operation, and this is the smallest um, uh, possible um, uh, uh, size, but note that in our approach, it really doesn't matter whether it has nine atoms, 25, or 49. You know, all of these things, you know, are done basically in exactly the same way. And so the key property, however, is that, you know, by increasing the distance, we should see that the operations improve with the system size. So I should note here is that a few miles uh, uh, away from here, earlier this year, there was actually some breakthrough experiment reported where uh, in the superconducting uh, platform, Pedram and co uh, collaborators implemented a uh, uh, single uh, surface code of distance three and distance five and just, you know, they watched it idling and tried to do multiple rounds of error correction and they saw that, you know, basically, you know, this uh, the, the, the kind of properties improve. So here, what we would like to do, we'd like to do actually a gate, a quantum operation. And in fact, you know, here is the uh, measurement uh, of this entangled distance seven or two logical qubits, you know, which clearly shows, you know, one is an X basis, now on Z basis, clearly shows that they're entangled, you know. And moreover, um, uh, as uh, if you look at the um, uh, Scaling with the code size, you know, you clearly see that the error in this bell state uh, uh, preparation actually decreases with, with code distance. That's a key property of the error correction that one uh, should be looking for. So there is wide, uh, there is a number of like important details here. So in particular, so uh, uh, in order to uh, absorb this, we actually had to decode these two qubits simultaneously in a correlated way rather than independently. If you use conventional decoding, then the um, uh, error grows rather than decreases, you know. Uh, moreover, uh, um, uh, uh, I should also note that, you know, in this operation, all we, we do is we do just one round of entanglement and we measure things. So in practice, you know, of course, you would like to, you know, do multiple rounds. So as a result, for example, here, the effective threshold is somewhat uh, higher. But nevertheless, you know, this, uh, 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 experiment demonstrates for the first time that you can actually benefit in doing logical operation from kind of this, you know, error correction and kind of growing uh, 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 the, the errors, you know, basically decrease with cone distance. So I should also mention, and this will be like a theme of my talk, you know, is that, you know, if you ask, you know, people on the street, they say, oh, what, you know, what is this, you know, fault tolerance and so on. Is it like, an, you know, how hard is it? And people say, oh, it's just an engineering problem. So I w would like to point out and emphasize it, you know, a couple more times. I believe that it is, of course, very challenging, important engineering problem. It's also super exciting scientific frontier. Just to give you a little bit of glimpse, let me just uh, describe what is this correlated decoding. This is not something that we invented, but it turns out to be super useful. So basically, if you do uh, this transversal uh, synod, what happens is that basically errors will propagate. So for example, if you had an error in one of the qubits um, uh, here, you know, it will actually upon the synod, you know, it will actually propagate on, you know, for, into two uh, qubits, you know, constituting this, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, surface code. And actually for this reason, you know, if you want to decode the, uh, uh, such an operation, it is uh, much better to look not just at each of these two blocks individually, but include also this, uh, this hyper edge. So basically this hyper edge, you know, corresponds to error kind of deterministically propagating, you know, and actually if you count it is what amounts to this correlated decoding. And it actually turns out to be kind of a very useful property, kind of in a, 
in this kind of short uh, uh, term present experiment, it allows us um, uh, for better correction of state preparation errors. So in these experiments, the preparation of the largest uh, surface code is actually non-fault tolerant, you know, because we just do one round, you know. Uh, but actually, uh, in future, you know, it also will allow for significant saving in space, time, cost, and this is actually something that we are working on, the kind of theory side. And I think it's also very much consistent with what our Google colleagues discovered in their, you know, single qubit uh, paper. So basically, you know, these are, you know, points out very exciting opportunity, which is the interface of quantum information, many body physics, and I would say also advanced quantum classical computing because decoding these things is not trivial. Okay, so, but, you know, we can do also other things. For example, we can do uh, state preparation in a fault tolerant way. So, and uh, uh, here what we do is we use color codes, which are similar to surface code, but a little bit different. And um, uh, we prepare pairs of them. And actually what we do is we use one of them as a kind of um, flag to check whether the other one was prepared in the right state or not. You know, and basically, uh, in these uh, experiments, what we do, we prepare color codes non-fault tolerantly, like, you know, just doing gates here. And then what we do, we just rotate one of them uh, using Hadamard, transversal Hadamard, and then actually bring them together, you know, entangle them, you know, and then, you know, if the first qubit is in a state zero here, uh, then we know that the upper one should be uh, zero, should be prepared for tolerantly, and this actually allows for like first break even experiments. So here, the state pre our state preparation is actually better both than the physical state preparation, but also better than the fidelity of C0 itself. So experiments like this have been done also very recently by, for example, now very nice work in the continuum group. Uh, uh, so in such, this is actually not new, but what is special here is we don't do this experiment just on one pair. So we do it now on five pairs, uh, on four, so here for some reason, but you know, okay. So we're doing many pairs in, in parallel. So actually we did at the end, we did experiments up to 20 pairs. You know, but, but, but what this means is that we now have some logical qubits, you know, already, which we can now use for circuits. And the simplest thing which we can do uh, is we can, for example, you know, build GG states, logical GG states, you know, and basically, you know, uh, by entangling them uh, together. And again, so what we see is that we, we do the, uh, you know, like a tomography of this state. So we see that basically, you know, uh, the logical uh, so states are clearly entangled and this false tolerant uh, pre preparation help and actually depending on what exactly do you do in decoding, you can actually have fidelity basically approaching one. And we can also, for example, here measure the expectation value of all 256 logical strings and actually, for example, do a full tomography of this, um, uh, 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 of this state. Another thing which we can do, we can do logical teleportation. So in this case, for example, we prepare JG state of three logical qubits, and then what we do, we just measure one in a mid circuit. And then depending on this measurement, we prepare one or another state of the remaining uh, qubits, and we can basically, uh, using feed forward, you know, basically, you know, correct this phase in this case, and indeed in this uh, situation, what we find, you know, and that is done by this moving one of these logical qubits in a separate zone, and basically, you know, reading it out, and then applying fast uh, feed forward, uh, feed forward uh, uh, step using FPGA, and you know basically what we see is that this procedure also works very well and creates in this case a, a, a bell state. So, with all of these things, what you see now is clearly the architecture is emerging. So we have done some storage zone, some entangling zone, and some readout zone, and basically we start can start utilizing them to really explore algorithms with uh, kind of error corrected um, uh, 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 logical uh, qubits. And uh, to do that, you know, uh, one actually has to be creative. So uh, in, the, in particular, in this early era of fault tolerant quantum computation, uh, there are some operations which are easier to do than others, you know? And so basically what we are learning and are illustrated here is that, you know, if you want to kind of ex execute some algorithm, you can of course just compile it using standard rules. But actually this is not maybe a best approach. What you do, you should optimize it with error correcting code and with native hardware capabilities. So I will just give one example, and I think I should be able to finish according to Alexei's prescription. So, and this would be a non-Clifford operation. So basically, you know, um, so far what I've shown involves something which is called Clifford circuits, which are X, Z, Hadamard, C0, 
all of them, it turns out, can be simulated classically because basically you can just look at that operator, how operators propagate. So to do something non-trivial, you need something which is called quantum magic, and this is non-Clifford operations. And actually, this quantum magic, it turns out, to implement it with error corrected, corrected states is very expensive. And the reason is fundamental because this error corrected circuits are fundamentally digital. They are not like this analog. You cannot just rotate, you know, anywhere on a block sphere. So, uh, uh, and this is, you know, challenging, but, you know, one question one could ask by, le by being less general, can we efficiently generate states which have a large amount of this quantum uh, uh, magic in a kind of inefficient way? So, and it turns out that it is possible. So to do it, however, we need to go beyond two-dimensional code. So in two-dimensional codes, all transversal gates are Clifford gates, you know. Uh, and, but if, if you go to the three-dimensional codes, for example, this is a smallest uh, color code in three dimension, 832 code, uh, which actually uh, exists on this edge, on, on, um, uh, on, on, this, on this cube. Uh, it has eight qubits, physical qubits, and codes, you know, three logical qubits and has distance too. So actually what it means is for one type of error, it's um, uh, just error detecting, it's not just error correcting. So, but the remarkable property of this, of this code is that you can actually uh, do non-Clifford operation, in particular you can do CCZ gate by just applying single atom you know, phase shifts, by, by applying like physical T gates on some of these uh, of, of qubits. And so basically, all together, what we can do, we can do CCZ gates, pairwise CZ gates within uh, uh, triplets uh, encoded, transversal CNOT, as was uh, shown, uh, already discussed before, and also a new type of gates. And altogether, this allows us to really do some non-trivial circuits. So specifically, the circuit which we'll now consider will be the following. So we'll prepare logical state and a state plus, and then we will do uh, rounds, including the CCZ, CZ gates, and CNOT gates, and then you know, permute them with several routes and then eventually measure kind of um, everything in kind of the next basis. So, uh, and it, this circuit will actually implement something uh, which already was mentioned called quantum scrubbing. And so, in fact, what we'll try to do with the circuit, we'll st starting with these cubes, encoded cubes, we will now create hypercubes of logical qubits. And uh, these uh, hypercubes will be of this type. So this is a logical connectivity. It's dimension four hypercube. So actually in terms of physical connectivity, it will be seven dimensional hypercube. So the reason why we are doing it is because A, it's very cool, you know. But second, you know, it's actually, it turns out that these circuits implement something is called instantaneous quantum polynomial circuits. So which actually are known to be scrambling, you know, uh, classically hard uh, uh, to sample for a large number of qubits. So it's a kind of super quantum supremacy circuit. Okay, so let's try to do this. So it's kind of like similar to quantum supremacy experiments by Padram et al., but again with logical qubits. And so here is, you know, example, small circuit with 12 logical qubits where we basically, um, you know, still can plot these probabilities of different bit strings. So this is a theory, you know, and when we start, when we don't do error correction, you know, we see something maybe resembles a little bit, but not really. So now we turn, in this case, error detection. You know, and what we see is this, you know, this desired probability distribution beautifully uh, emerges from this. And so one can quantify it in different ways. For example, you can look at XCB, which is here, uh, basically like a, a fidelity. And basically it shows that, you know, results with this error detection are very close to ideal state. So we went forward and did this experiments also with 24 and 48 logical qubits. And this 48 logical qubits, so here is a circuit at a logical level where we, which we implement. And what we see is that this error detection in this case still considerably improves the performance. In fact, it's more than a factor of 10 better than best physical implementation. So this is actually a physical kind of graph which corresponds to this logical circuit. So, and um, uh, this uh, result is all, is, you know, means that we, it's really, these algorithms perform very, you know, successfully, in fact, improve upon what is possible to do uh, with physical qubits. So here is a movie, how we make this, uh, 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 this circuit. So it started by making small codes, and then you see you, you entangle more and more. So here we run out of space, so we have to move some of these qubits, drop them in the storage zone, bring the other, and then entangle again them locally, right? And then start entangling logical qubits, you know, 
bigger and then bigger again. And then in the final step, we will entangle them all. We'll bring them this up and just entangle them all. You know, so this is uh, the, the operation. So you could say, okay, why is this kind of a lot of fun? Is it actually useful? It turns out it can be useful. And uh, yesterday there was talks about page curves and entanglement growth. So actually we can prove, probe the entanglement growth with this circuit. So the way to do it is to use two copy measurements. So this two copy measurement is a very powerful tool, uh, which allows you to extract, you know, a lot of information. So basically it's fully compatible with logical qubits and transversal CNOT. And uh, what we do here is we basically, in this case, we do a scrambling circuit on 12 logical qubits, you know, and two copies, you know, and then just do the Bell state measurement and the result is shown here. So basically if you don't do any error detection in this case, you know, what you see is that your entanglement entropy, you know, basically growing and eventually saturates. But if you apply error detection, what you see is beautiful page curve. It's in space rather than time, but nevertheless, you know, um, kind of very special. So it really shows you that logical qubits uh, can be useful for probing physics of entangled system and there are really exciting opportunities with these early fault tolerant processors. So uh, I think there are exciting avenues opening ahead. So I think we have a clear path to building devices with maybe about 100 logical qubits and reasonably deep circuits. And there are also opportunities to scale them even further. For example, this quantum LDPC codes, which were mentioned, you know, which were very, very interested. And I think, you know, it's really, kind of, you know, exciting both in a medium scale, but also um, uh, in a kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, long run. So I hope I convince you that it's really an exciting uh, scientific frontier. And I would like to um, basically stop uh, here by thanking uh, you for your attention and thanking all these people whose blood and sweat, you know, result in this work. Actually, this work was mostly done by a small group of graduate students and postdocs, but of course also with support uh, of Quera, which we have now very nice collaboration. Thank you so much. Questions? Uh, very nice talk, thanks. Uh, I, I have a question about your non-Clifford yeah. case. Uh, in, the, in the scrambling circuit, did you do code switching to did you do code switching? No, we don't need to do code switching in this case. So the reason is that, so basically this, um, uh, this 3D code, it allows us to do non-Clifford. It uh, will lose um, uh, Hadamard, but we still, we can prepare qubits in the X state. So what we do, we prepare qubits in the X state, and we just run the circuit. We do not need to do code switching. Okay, right. got you, thanks. So it's not the general, but it's, you know, for that it's actually, it's the fastest scrambler. In terms of so, so it's like an access state is uh, like a magic state for your circuit and your circuit is not in, in some sense like that, right? Uh, there's, no, there's no magic. Well, I mean, magic is injected through these CCZs, you know? It's magic in the usual basis. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. And actually we measure this, we can measure this magic with this two copy, you know, yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, two questions. On, on one of your earlier slides, you, you showed the Van der Waals potential as scaling as n to the 11th power. You showed for yeah. 100 atoms, this times 10 to the 14th. Can you give some, where is this coming from? 10 where, to the 11th? Yeah, and, or n to the 11th, the n, number n to of the atoms. 11th. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it's actually, it's a super, you know, I can explain it, you know, so it's basically, it comes from, originates from uh, R cubed, you know, uh, interaction, in a second order perturbation theory. So it's just, it's, it's a super nice homework problem. I can, I can. No, no, no that's the one over yes. our six. It's, I, I, it's n to the 11th. It's n to the, yeah, it, yeah. N, it's n to the 11th and it's, yeah. It, exactly, yes. And it's n to the fourth, which is two dipoles, you know, you know, square, you uh -huh. know, divided. So it's a kind of atomic physics. We can, so it's n is a principal quantum number. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. 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 And then the second yeah. question. Uh, so these transversal C knots yeah. are they operating kind of like on W states or GH because they're operating non-locally? Are they are they only for these kinds of no, entanglements? On any. Any. But they but they're for non their operations across the whole qubit array non-locally. What are we? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a logical. You mean logical operation? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, so well, it's depending on which one, which we bring. So what we do, we take blocks and bring them together. And in one shot, we act 
physically on all qubits. And if we program circuit collector, it would implement transversal C0 for logical qubits. Okay, and and then my first that first question, the n in the principal, it wasn't the principal quantum number; it was the number of atoms. N n was scaling not as the quantum number. No, but the, n to the eleventh was a principal quantum number, eleventh power of principal quantum number. Oh, because it said n as the number of atoms on your slide. So I just making sure that it, you meant that. No, I'm to the eleventh oh. power. It's principal quantum number. Okay, I'm so sorry. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, how fast do you move these atoms? Yeah. Does that have any effect on the entanglement <coughs> generation that you're having? Yeah, so it is, um, so this uh, moving of the atoms <coughs> is, uh, it takes time. So the kind of time scale is about, um, you know, 100 microseconds, you know, maybe even, you know, a couple of hundred microseconds, you know, um, in this case. So it does not, like the, li the, the qubit lifetime is seconds, so the effect is minimal. But of course, this moving of the atoms, you know, affects our clock speed, you know. And uh, this is something, you know, for that, of course, it allows us to do all-to-all -all connectivity. Um, and, you know, there are ways to kind of accelerate that, you know. It's not a limitation now, but, you know, for future, we're a couple of things we're thinking about, yeah, how to accelerate it, yeah. So, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Just so what do you think is the perspective to obtain a, a more, I would say, fashion proof of quantum advantage on something like the short algorithm or like factorizing prime numbers beyond what's all? Well, okay, so as I already kind of, as in my uh, last, so I kind of went quick, pretty quickly. So I do think that techniques which we have now, they will directly scale to like uh, tens of thousands of physical qubits. Uh, and, uh, like, by reducing our physical error rates a little bit, so we kind of imagine, as I said, the clear path to, like, 100 logical qubits, you know, then to the minus 6. I mean, this will already be, you know, very hard to, well, it will be impossible to simulate, uh, but, of course, you cannot factor numbers. So, going to, let's say, something closer to the 1,000 or maybe a couple of 1,000 qubits, you know, there are some technical challenges that needs to be, that need to be solved, uh, but I think there are also a lot of opportunities to solve these challenges. So, and I think in the next few years, we really will see a lot of progress towards that. So I think your credit cards are still okay, you know, for now. But, uh, but you know, maybe, you know. Yeah. I had a question about the mid-circuit readout and feed yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, when you measure your ancillary qubits, how, how destroyed is your quantum system, or is it completely non-destructive? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's, so you mean this measure, so, so in the measurement like this, for example, so the, uh, so, uh, I mean, there is, um, uh, there, it can be quantified by two ways. One is by kind of readout fidelity, which actually, in this case, about 99%, uh, and the crosstalk, which is actually below 10 to the minus 3. And this crosstalk is due to just atom which, uh, light, which is a little bit scattered, you know. So it's in principle very tech, it's kind of, you know, like very technical and, you know, can be improved. So this way is actually, is extreme, it's actually extremely powerful, you know, yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious about the 10K atom limit that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, is that like a hardware limitation due to the spatial light modulators and AOM that you're using, or is it more so a limit of the algorithms you're working with? Uh, no, so it is, um, so this 10K basically limit comes from just taking the techniques we use now and try to, to basically just use them with a little bit better optimized, you know, settings. So for example, right now, uh, we have the, um, uh, the objective with about, you know, 400 micrometer field of view, right? Uh, but, you know, of course, you know, like to write the, 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 the chip, semiconductor chips, you know, you write six inch wafers, right? So there is a big, you know, we can, imp you know, increase it in a big way. And so, for example, we already have like a next generation of our experiment uses the um, uh, objective with a couple of millimeters uh, of field of view. So you immediately get uh, scale up. So. Uh, of course, you need to also increase the laser power, and basically, you know, at the level of few tens of the qubits, you know, we believe we can just, you know, increase it without, you know, you know, sacrificing anything. You know, eventually, you will need to either, you know, just use more lasers, you know, or be more clever. And then, for example, you know, uh, you know, 
People in the field also demonstrated kind of a hybrid system where you use, for example, optical lattices to store atoms and tweezers to move them around. So techniques like this, you know, at this point would be very, 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 very useful. So I think these are all technical, you know, limitations, but you know, everything is technical, right? So it's, um, yeah. Last question. Yeah. Nisha, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, if you think about this technology long term, yeah. uh, what keeps you up at night? What's, uh, what's the worst uh, problem in your mind? I'm quite happy. I'm sleeping very well, Mike. <laughs> I'm, I'm sleeping quite well. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, look, this is, I mean, okay, so. Let me, I will, it's a little bit kind of philosophical point which I'll make here. So, you know, you know, people and like, you know, you know, working in this, you know, sort of, you know, frontier of building quantum computers, you know, oftentimes after the first few experiments, you say, oh, you know, we have fidelities of 90%. I mean, theoretically, we should get four nines, no problem, you know, it's all engineering, right? And, you know, it is, you know, there is a lot of engineering, but these statements are kind of shallow, right? And basically, you know, like, for example, right, I would love to push fidelities to four nights because then every, you know, all overhead will be, you know. So, but, you know, at this point, I think we have a very clear path to three nights because we understand our errors and so on, but we don't understand what will limit us beyond three nights, right? So, kind of like, you know, that's one in the direction. Another direction which you might, you know, but then, so look, it's, you know, the technical thing. I mean, I think on the other direction, I think the codes which people have so far explored, for example, surface codes, are extremely wasteful, right? And this example of 832 really shows that's the case. So for example, I really hope that, you know, motivated by that, you know, people, you know, start developing new codes where you can actually have higher density still efficient operations and maybe even co-designed for some problems, you know? So things like this are real opportunities. They're both challenges and opportunities. And I think, I hope really the next few years it will be, you know, super exciting time in this, you know? So, yeah. Let's thank uh, Inche again.